Weak dribbler, poor technically, mediocre pace, greedy, and only scores tap-ins. Those are all words fans have used to discredit Filippo Inzaghi. Even the greatest football minds football has to offer like Johan Cruyff and Sir Alex Ferguson have made what you could consider insults or at best backhanded compliments. Cruyff would go on to flat out say he can't play football, he's just always in the right position and Alex Ferguson would just say he was born offside. I think the funniest way I've seen somebody describe Inzaghi was a user in reddit calling him the Mr. Bean of strikers because of their similarities and despite looking awkward and clumsy they always manage to come out on top. Regardless of all the jokes and digs thrown at Inzaghi, one thing that can't be taken away from him was his killer instinct for putting the ball at the back of the net. Inzaghi would have this special ability to go missing for almost the whole game for 89 minutes but still appear out of nowhere and catch a defender lacking just one moment to score a goal. If you had to use one word to describe his game, it would be a poacher, a fox in the box whose sole purpose was to put fear into defenders and draw penalties and score goals. I mean even Mbappe today uses the name Inzaghi as a synonym to poachers. While he may not have been gifted the technical ability of strikers like Del Piero or Raul or the physical acumen of strikers like R9 Ronaldo and Drogba, he made up for his deficiency with his timing and instinct to beat offside traps to always put himself in position to score goals. And even though his finishes might not have looked the prettiest or sometimes even accidental, his finishing ability was still world class and if he got in position to score, you just knew he was going to more than likely score 9 times out of 10. What's most impressive was that he was doing all this while playing in arguably one of the toughest eras for attackers, late 90s to mid 2000s Serie A. This era was filled with legendary defenders like Maldini, Cannavaro, and Zambrota, and teams would pride themselves in keeping clean sheets, as most games would see at most two goals from either teams. Limited technically, not gifted athletically, and an unforgiving league for attackers, but despite all that, Inzaghi knew from an early age he could become a center forward scoring goals at the highest level. Young Inzaghi would grow up in a city called Piacenza in Italy where his passion for the sport of football grew. Funny enough, he wasn't even the best footballer technically in his family, with his younger brother Simone possessing some of the technical skills that was missing from his brother. Though Filippo was still a great footballer in his own regard and he would join his hometown club Piacenza at the age of 12 where he would train in their youth setup. He would continue playing for Piacenza's youth team until he turned 18 where he was called up to make his professional debut where he would make two league appearances before being loaned out to Serie C side Lefe. At Lefe, Inzaghi would prove he was ready for a step up in competition as he would score an impressive 13 goals in 21 games. This performance would earn him a move to Hellas Verona who played in the Serie B at the time. At Verona, Inzaghi would score 13 goals yet again and with this low move, it convinced his parent club Piacenza to finally give him his chance to play consistently for the club. Inzaghi made sure to repay the fate put in him by the club as he would play a pivotal role in Piacenza winning the Serie B with him scoring 15 goals in 37 matches. His season wouldn't go unnoticed and Parma would pay a transfer fee of 3.05 million euros to sign the talented youngster. At Parma, he would join a talented team mixed with youth and experience as the team possessed future legends in the back line like 18 year old Buffon and a 22 year old Cannavaro who were led by veterans in the front line with Zola and Stoichkov leading the way. But Parma's experience up front didn't benefit Inzaghi as one would hope because he would struggle for playtime as the team opted for the more experienced Alessandro Melli with Inzaghi struggling in the matches he did play as he would only score 2 goals in 15 league games. Parma were quick to give up on Inzaghi with them deciding to sell him just one season after the transfer as he would go down the Serie A table to join Atalanta. Atalanta's squad was considerably weaker than Parma but this turned out to be a blessing in disguise as Inzaghi would be the big fish in this pond and became the undisputed starter at striker. This season Inzaghi would make Parma regret selling him so quickly as he would go on on the rampage scoring a goal against every club in the league to score a total of 24 goals in the league which would make him the leading goal scorer in Serie A. Atlanta would cash in on Inzaghi immediately as they would sell him to Italian giants Juventus for 10.3 million euros as Inzaghi alongside Edgar Davids from Milan would join a Juve squad who just came off of a league winning season. At Juve, Inzaghi and Del Piero would be the two strikers up front in Juventus' narrow 4-4-2 formation this season and before the season started there were questions if the two strikers would be strong enough for Juventus. And it was a fair question to ask because there were still questions if Inzaghi was a one season wonder and if he could perform in a top team like Juve and he was supposed to replace Christian Vieri who was sold by Juve the same year for almost double the price that Inzaghi was brought in for. 
And for Del Piero, his best season to date only had 13 goals in all competitions to show for it. Inzaghi's first game for Juventus would see him get a chance to earn a trophy for the club as the team would face Vicenza in the Italian Super Cup. And just 4 minutes into the game, Inzaghi would score in a classic Inzaghi style as he would hit the post which then bounced off the keeper to go into the air which then forced the keeper to punch it out right into Inzaghi as he would convert the easy tap in. Just 6 minutes later, Inzaghi would score another goal as he would get behind the defense and strike the ball across to make the score 2-0 in just the 10th minute of the game. Juventus would take control for the rest of the game as they went on to win the Super Cup 3-0 and just in the first match for the club, and in just his first two goals for the club, Inzaghi would display a performance that would perfectly describe him. With a lucky goal that looked too good to be true, and also a goal that saw him time his run well to score. After this great start to the season, the duo of Inzaghi and Del Piero would go on to prove the doubters wrong, as they scored a total of 39 goals in Serie A that season, with an almost even distribution with 18 coming from Inzaghi and 21 from Del Piero. Their goals would put Juventus in a position to do a double, and by the end of the year, the title race came down to a battle between Inter and Juventus, with Inter being led by a new striker of their own as they had just signed R9 Ronaldo from Barca that year. With two games left in the season, Juventus had the lead with 70 points compared to Inter's 66 points, and the second to the last match for Juventus would be against Bologna. This game would be no easy task for Juventus as Bologna was a solid upper mid-table club that year as they finished 8th and elsewhere Inter would take on SSC Bari. For Juventus, the game would get off to a bad start as Kolivanov would score near post in the 11th minute in a goal that looked like it should have been saved by the keeper. The game would be very physical and hard fought from both sides, but Inzaghi would come through for Juve as he converted across with the header just 23 minutes after the first goal. And just 15 minutes later, Inzaghi would give Juve the lead with another assist from Zidane. Juventus wouldn't hold on to the lead for very long though, as just 6 minutes later, Baggio would score a tight finish to tie the game 2-2. And the game looked like it would head to a draw until the 80th minute, where Inzaghi would find himself at the end of another cross to boot Juve up in the game, as the match would finish 3-2 with Inzaghi's hat-trick clinching the title for Juventus. Inzaghi would also play in a European competition for the first time in his career that year, and the duo of Inzaghi and Del Piero would also find success in the Champions League. Inzaghi would put 4 goals past Dynamo Kiev in the quarterfinals to advance Juve to the semi-finals where they would take on Henri's Monaco who just beat Manchester United. In this tie, Del Piero would score 4 goals of his own which was enough for Juventus to move past Monaco 6-4 in aggregate to reach the finals where they would take on Real Madrid. Unfortunately for Juventus, the strike partnership would come up short in this match as Juve would be held to a clean sheet as Madrid would go on to win their first European trophy in 32 years. 32 years since they last won this competition, since 1966. The next season started off on a terrible news for Juventus as Del Piero tore his ACL in November, which would keep him out for the rest of the season, which meant Inzaghi would be solely relied upon to score the goals. To Inzaghi's credit, that he would do as he led the team in goals with 20 in 40 matches in all competitions, but even with Inzaghi's goals, the team would struggle as they finished 7th in the league that year. Although their league results had gone terribly, their performance in the Champions League was a bright spot that year as they reached the semi-finals to face Manchester United. The first leg ended in a 1-1 draw as Ryan Giggs scored in extra time, and although the end result might have been disappointing for Juventus, they could still stay positive as they had kept the aggregate tied after Old Trafford which meant they had all to play for in their home ground in Turin. And Juventus would quickly forget about the disappointing finish in the first leg because Inzaghi would score just in the 6th minute from Zidane's cross. But Inzaghi wasn't done yet because just 5 minutes later Inzaghi scored again as the ball deflected into the net. It seemed almost certain Juventus would be heading to the Champions League finals 2 years in a row, but then something crazy happened. First a header from Roy Keane, then another header from Dwight York just 10 minutes later tied the aggregate 3-3 with 56 minutes left to play, and in the 83rd minute the unthinkable happened, as Dwight York took the ball off the defender to go through on goal, which gave Andy Cole the easy tap-in to clinch United's spot in the Champions League final. Del Piero would return in the 1999 season, but he wasn't the Del Piero of old as he would struggle to score goals or at least open play goals, as the few goals he got mainly came from free kicks and penalties. This struggle in form coincided with Inzaghi and Del Piero's relationship deteriorating. From Inzaghi's side, he got tired of taking the abuse in the penalty box and never being the one to reap the rewards. And also because of the fact that Del Piero had just signed a new contract with the team as Inzaghi continued being massively out earned by Del Piero while Inzaghi was the one outperforming his teammates. And for Del Piero, his frustrations came from the fact that Inzaghi rarely passed the ball to Del Piero 
electing to take shots from tough angles rather than pass to the open Del Piero, while Del Piero set up Inzaghi with multiple of his goals that year. By the end of the season, Inzaghi ended up with 26 total goals with 15 of those goals coming from the league, while Del Piero had 9 goals in the league with 8 of those goals coming from penalties. Although things might have been a bit messy at Juventus, Inzaghi would still get called up to Euro 2000 where he was a consistent starter. And for Italy, he would get a chance to take penalties where he proved he can score penalties too in Italy's 2-1 victory over Turkey. He would get his next goal in the quarterfinals against Romania where Italy would go on to win the game 2-0. In the semifinals, Italy would face a tough Netherlands team where each team denied others of goals which resulted in the game going to penalties where Italy would ultimately win. In the finals, Italy would play France where they would take the early lead. But a 98 minute goal from Wiltord forced the game into golden goal where Trezeguet would win France the game. As Inzaghi returned his focus to Juventus, the duo's relationship continued to deteriorate into the next season and it was clear Juventus had a choice to make. Either Inzaghi or Del Piero had to leave, as it was clear the relationship was beyond repair. And it was clear who they chose, as the new signing Trezeguet, the man who denied Italy from winning the Euros, started to get selected over Inzaghi in the second half of the season. And this decision would get confirmed in the summer, as they sold him to their rivals AC Milan for 23 million euros and Christian Zanoni. In Milan, Inzaghi and also top signings Perlo and Rui Costa would be joining a squad that had talented players like Maldini, Gattuso, and Shevchenko, but still struggled massively ever since their last league win in 1999, three years ago. Inzaghi and Milan would start off slow, and by November of that season, Milan would sack their manager Tarim and appoint a new manager. A manager Inzaghi was very familiar with, Carlo Ancelotti who was sacked just last season at Juventus during halftime of the last game of their season for failing to win the league as they finished two points behind Roma. Unfortunately for Inzaghi, he would get injured before getting to play much for the new manager as he would be kept out for three months before returning to action. Once he returned to action, it was clear his already not so great pace took a bit of a hit. But regardless, Inzaghi was able to rely on his instincts and finishing to score goals even with the weakened physicals. And him and Shevchenko would go on to form an amazing strike partnership as Inzaghi scored 16 goals in 28 games while Shevchenko scored 17 in 38. Their goals contributed to Milan earning a spot in the Champions League next season as they finished 4th in the league that year, while in Europe they reached all the way up until the semi-finals where they got knocked out by Dortmund. While Milan had their best season in 3 years, the owner Silvio Berlusconi still wasn't satisfied because he expected a more attacking style of football after the money he spent the previous year. So with this in mind, Ancelotti adapted. He changed his formation to a 4-1-3-2 where Perlo would be converted from attacking midfielder to more of a defensive midfielder. And looking back, this team was incredibly stacked as they had Maldini and Nesta at center back with Perlo sitting in front of the back line and right behind the midfield of Gattuso, Seydorf and Costa while Inzaghi and Shevchenko were the two strikers up front. In this season, Inzaghi was on fire in Europe scoring 9 goals in just the group stage matches alone as Milan finished top of their group above Real Madrid and they would get matched with Ajax for the first knockout round. The first match would end scoreless as they headed to San Siro for the second leg of the series. And in this match, Inzaghi continued his hot streak in Europe as he would give Milan the lead in the 31st minute with the header. But this goal wouldn't be the last in this game as Littman would score in the 62nd minute to tie the game 1-1. But Milan would surely respond with a goal of their own as Inzaghi would draw the keeper out and strike the ball which deflected into the air and into his partner Shevchenko's head to give Milan the lead back. 2-1. But unfortunately for Milan, they would give up another goal with just 13 minutes remaining in regular time as Pioneer would score after falling down and getting back up to put Ajax ahead on away goals. With just 13 minutes left in the game, it seemed more and more likely that Milan would get knocked out of the tournament in just the first round. But in the 90th minute, magic happened as Ambrosini headed the ball towards Inzaghi who put the ball into the air above the keeper as Mason would score the tap-in to send Milan through to the semi-finals. In the semi-finals, they faced Inter where the first leg ended scoreless just like the last series. And in the second leg, Shevchenko would score just before halftime to send Milan through to the finals on away goals as the game ended in 1-1 draw. As they advanced to the finals, Ancelotti and Zaghi would meet familiar faces as they got matched up with their former team Juventus who threw both of them out the door. 
as the manager and the player would get their chance to get revenge on their former employers. This match would see two prolific strike partnerships go head to head as Trezeguet and Del Piero would try their best to outdo their opponents of Inzaghi and Shevchenko. But while there were iconic names in attack, after a chaotic first half where both teams had chances to score but failed to convert, the game would be dominated by both teams defenses and their refusal to concede in the second half and extra time which forced the game into penalties. The first man to take penalties? Trezeguet, the man who scored the golden goal to beat Inzaghi's Italy in the Euro 2000s finals and who replaced him the very same year in Juventus. Inzaghi would come out on top this time as Trezeguet would strike the ball low and weak which got saved. The next two penalties would be converted by both sides to make it a 1-1 game. But for Milan, they missed their own second penalty which gave Juventus a chance to take the lead. But they would fail to capitalize on their moment. But again, Milan would fail to convert their penalty in their third try as Buffon saved the shot with his legs. But Milan would have an identical save of their own. And after all these missed chances, the next two penalties would go in, with Shevchenko receiving the chance to win Milan the Champions League with his fifth penalty. And that he did, as he put the ball away into the corner as Milan came out victorious, with Inzaghi and Ancelotti getting their revenge just two years after being let go by the club. In the next season, things wouldn't look as rosy for Inzaghi, as injury problems would come back to haunt him and caused him to be in and out of the lineup and this would mess up Inzaghi's form massively as he would score just 3 goals in 14 league matches. But for Milan, the team form wouldn't be affected too much as Tomasen did a fine job as a replacement, scoring 12 goals in 26 league games while Shevchenko led the league in goals with 26 as Milan would set Serie A record in points with 82 as they comfortably won the league. While Milan would celebrate their amazing season, Inzaghi would undergo an ankle surgery by the end of the season. And for Inzaghi, his ankle issues wouldn't go away as he would have a second ankle surgery just 6 months later in October of the next season. And once he came back from the injury, he injured his hand again just 4 days after returning, which sidelined him for one more month until he was back at the end of February. By the end of the year, Inzaghi played a total of 448 minutes in the league with 0 goals to show for it. But on a positive note, Milan would go on to reach their second Champions League final in just 3 years which Inzaghi would unfortunately have to miss due to injuries. The game would start off as good as you can ask for if you're Milan, as Maldini scored in the first minute while Crespo would turn the score to 3-0 as he scored 2 goals right before halftime. Things took a turn for the worse for Milan after halftime as Liverpool would score back to back to back in the span of 7 minutes and just like that the game was all tied up in the 61st minute. The game would settle down onwards with the game remaining 3-3 after extra time as the game headed towards penalties where after 4 penalties from each side the score was 2-3 with the advantage going towards Liverpool with Shevchenko taking Milan's last penalty. Shevchenko had to convert his penalty to keep Milan alive but unlike the last final he was unable to deliver as he shot straight down the middle which got saved as Liverpool pulled off one of the most improbable comebacks in Champions League history. Fortunately for Inzaghi, he would mostly stay healthy the next season and he was able to get back to form as he scored 17 goals in 31 matches. And this return to form came at the perfect time as this would earn him a spot in the 2006 World Cup for Italy. While he was behind other strikers in the team, he was still able to make an appearance in Italy's group stage match against Czech Republic as he would get subbed in at 68 minutes for Alberto Gilardino, and Inzaghi was able to make the most of his chance as he would score a goal late into the game which led to Italy winning the match 2-0. Even with that, Italy elected to start other strikers ahead of him, and Italy was able to make a deep run in the tournament as they reached the finals to play France, who they played 6 years earlier in Euro 2000 in the finals. But this time it would be Italy who came away as victors, as they would win the game in penalties to win the World Cup. That summer would also see massive changes in Milan as Shevchenko would get sold in a massive 43 million euros transfer to Chelsea. And this change encouraged Ancelotti to change his tactics as he would switch to a lone striker formation in a narrow 4-3-2-1 with Inzaghi leading the way. While Inzaghi would score in the first match of the season against Lazio, he would find himself in terrible form as he failed to score a league goal for 5 months until the end of January. To be fair to Inzaghi, he was getting up there in age at this point as he was 33 and he did have an extensive history with injuries, so at this point most people believed Inzaghi was done as a player. His fall in form also resulted in Milan stumbling down the table as they found themselves 13th by Christmas, even with Kaka doing his best to put in performances. Milan themselves believed Inzaghi was done and they chose to purchase R9 Ronaldo that January transfer window to replace Inzaghi at the striker to attempt to stop their fall in the table. While R9 Ronaldo was still an amazing player, there was one problem. 
Since Ronaldo already played in the Champions League for Real Madrid that season, he was cup tied, meaning he couldn't play for Milan in Europe. Even with Milan's dreadful performances in the league, all wasn't lost for them as in Europe they would defeat Celtic in the round of 16. In the quarterfinals, Milan would face Bayern where they drew the first leg 2-2. And in the second leg, Inzaghi would score his first goal in two and a half months as he scored the final goal in the series as Milan defeated Bayern 4-2 in aggregate to advance to the semifinals to play the previous year's Champions League winner, Manchester United. In the first leg, Wayne Rooney would score a brace as he gave United the lead in the series 3-2 as they headed towards San Siro for the second leg where Milan would keep a clean sheet as they scored three goals to beat United with the last goal coming from Inzaghi's substitute, Gilardino. In what seemed like a storyline written by movie writers, Milan's opponent would end up being Liverpool, who had beaten them just two years earlier in a dramatic fashion in the Champions League final. Ancelotti would have a massive choice to make in terms of his squad selection, particularly at striker, because on paper, Gilardino would be the obvious choice as he was younger and in much better form than Inzaghi. But Inzaghi just had that magic about him, something that couldn't be explained by GA or any other stat. He just had the experience and instincts to score goals in big matches. The owner Berlusconi would propose a solution to this question as he would suggest starting the younger, fresher Gilardino to start the match to wear down the opponents and Inzaghi would get subbed on late into the game to catch the tired defenders lacking. Even in the final training session before the finals, Inzaghi looked completely out of sync and the Milan executive would tell Ancelotti why don't we let Gilardino play and Ancelotti responds saying Inzaghi is a strange animal. Maybe tomorrow will be his night. With that said, Ancelotti would stick to his gut and he would start Inzaghi in what was a bold choice that could blow up in his face if he failed to perform like he had all season. The game would stay scoreless until just before halftime, where Kaka would earn a free kick in a dangerous spot as he made Alonso make a reckless tackle. Perlo would take the free kick and in what looked almost accidental, the ball would hit Inzaghi's arm and go straight into the net as Milan took the lead. And while his first goal may have looked lucky, he would score another goal to prove it's not all luck as he perfectly timed his run to get himself through on goal where he rounded the keeper to effectively close the game out as Milan would go on to redeem their nightmare performance just two years earlier with Inzaghi's man of the match performance. This performance would prove to everyone that Inzaghi still got it at his ripe old age and in the next two seasons he would score 18 and 16 goals respectively. After two seasons, new manager Leonardo would come in to replace Ancelotti and Leonardo would delegate the now 36 year old Inzaghi to bench duty. He would be mostly utilized as a substitute in big matches like those in the Champions League and in his second season with Leonardo, he would be called upon to save the day against Real Madrid in the Champions League as Inzaghi would get subbed on in the 68th minute as Milan were down 1-0 where Madrid were dominating possession and the chances in the game. Inzaghi would do what he does best and score two goals to give Milan the lead in a match where Madrid were completely peppering Milan with shots but even with Inzaghi's heroics, the game ended in a 2-2 draw with Madrid scoring in the 94th minute. Just a week after his vintage performance, Inzaghi would end up injuring his ACL and by this point, it seemed like it was inevitable that would be the end of Inzaghi. But Inzaghi refused to retire and came back before the season ended, when many believed that he was certainly done for the season. Inzaghi would come back the next season and he would finally play his last match of his career at the end of the season, as Milan played Novara and in this match, Inzaghi would put in one last classic Inzaghi performance as he would score the winning goal by putting the ball over the keeper. Just like that, Inzaghi would retire as a winner who won everything the game had to offer, winning multiple Serie A titles and Champions League titles and even the lucrative World Cup. While Inzaghi might have never wowed people with his skills or banger finishes, he had the mentality and instinct that very few possessed that allowed him to score crucial goals in big matches. And what's also understated is how his game held up as he aged as he was able to play until he was 38, long after his pace and physicals had been faded due to his injuries and age. Many people called Inzaghi lucky, but to that I say, in order to get lucky, you have to put yourself in position to get lucky. And Inzaghi did just that throughout his career, so can you really call it luck? 